Hello, and welcome to Gateway to Privacy, a podcast from global law firm KNL Gates, where we discuss the latest developments and best practices in today's data protection, privacy, and security industry. We hope you enjoy this discussion. Please reach out to suggest topics or guests or with questions about data privacy law. Hello, and welcome to the Gateway to Privacy podcast. Today, we got a very special episode um, with our European team. Uh, I'll be your host, Claude Tiedamago, a partner in the Paris office of KNL Gates. Hi, I am Thomas Liebsch from the Berlin office, and I'm happy to join this call and talk to all our colleagues about all the issues we may face in terms of GDPR and privacy in general, and who else have we have, do we have on the line? Hi, I'm Noreen McFadden. I'm a consultant lawyer in the London office of KNL Gates, specializing in data protection and privacy. Hi, it's Laura Correri from KNL Gates Milan office today. Hi, this is Camille Scaparo. I work at the Paris office of KNL Gates and specialize in uh, data protection and privacy. Hi, my name is Andreas. I'm also working like Thomas in the Berlin office, and I'm especially focusing on GDPR topics and some other uh, digital-related stuff. Hi, I am Gianmarco from Milan office. Welcome, everybody. We've got a very special episode today um, because we're releasing this on May the 4th, which is a relatively special date for our uh, pop culture fan out there. Um, and also, May 2023 will mark the fifth anniversary of GDPR. So uh, the purpose of uh, this episode is to see what happened in the past five years and what may happen in the month or year to come. Um, so happy anniversary, GDPR. Um, five years, that's uh, basically uh, when, uh, for humans, uh, uh, when a kid starts to get some independence, they can walk alone, they can talk, they can talk a lot. Uh, but they're still on the way to uh, to construct themselves as a self uh, independent being. So what have we learned in the past five years? Anybody wants to jump in about some uh, looking back into the past five years and see what happened? Thanks, Claude Etienne, for this introduction. And in fact, yeah, we when we started five years ago, um, or a bit more because, of course, the text of GDPR was um, known to us beforehand, but it was all like... Uh, a bit being thrown like in, in cold water um, on uh, May 25th, back in 2018. And so were, was it for all the companies who had to deal with it of, uh, in one instance. Um, we saw many of them which um, did a lot of upfront work. Others called into us like three days uh, prior to uh, the kickoff date and said, well, we wondered whether there's anything we should have in mind or so. And yeah, so we uh, took it from there, and it has been five interesting years. Um, what has it brought all to all of us? I, I would say the first spot, it was a lot of work for the consultants involved. So a lot of <laughs> money has been made with GDPR stuff. What did it not bring so much? Um, clarity and transparency for companies, I believe, which are still struggling to... Um, yeah, get a proper understanding of what is required of from them. And the same goes um, as well for the data subjects. Um, so I'm also not sure if they feel safer with their data now after GDPR kicked in um, than before. I, for myself, I don't think so, but that's for anyone to decide on their own, I guess. Well, maybe they do not feel necessarily safer, but what is clear is that they are more aware of their right. Um, so one of the main goal of GDPR was to raise awareness, to raise education of the individuals affected by GDPR. And in that regard, uh, it clearly um, matched um, its expectation, maybe above and beyond. Noreen? Um, yes, uh, we have certainly seen that here in the London office. Um, the awareness of data subject rights completely exploded after GDPR came on the scene. I mean, we always had subject access rights beforehand, but we hardly ever saw a, sub a data subject access request. 
And since um, GDPR came into force over the past five years, we've had an absolutely exponential growth in the numbers of matters that we've handled, particularly in employment matters, um, where there's often a dispute between a former or um, departing employee and their company. And one of the first things that we now see is a subject access request being um, being lodged with the employer um, and in other areas too, in general litigation and in um, consumer disputes. Um, it's become a real um, growth area for us, um, but it, it does speak to um, how embedded in people's rights um, GDPR has become. And I have to say in sort of more personal um, conversations with people, the first thing they ask about when I mention that I do data protection was, how can I get access to my data? <laughs> so obviously it's it's become a part of the cultural scene. And I think particularly here in the UK, data subjects are really, really aware of it. And GDPR is synonymous with having control over and access to your own data, which is pretty remarkable for five years for that to, to have become su- such an embedded part of people's lives. It's been weaponized, really, because uh, I feel like anytime there is a uh, labor dispute, if the employee lo- lawyers up, the first thing that will be done is just submitting a template uh, data subject access request just to maybe change the balance into negotiation. We've certainly seen that. Um, so we have seen uh, as a f- sort of a first step to litigation, the subject access request will appear. It'll be in a standard format. And um, we've even seen it said that it is part of the process of, a, of a, uh, an employment dispute. That's from employment lawyers, not from data protection lawyers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And it is a hugely stressful and costly thing sometimes to deal with the subject access request where, um, you know, somebody has a long history of working with a company and therefore loads and loads of personal data to be sifted through. Um, I think Andy might have something to add on this topic too. Yes, um, thanks for uh, handing over to me. Um, yes, especially this um, data subject, uh, data access request topic has become some, some kind of litigation strategy also in Germany. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where um, data subjects requested access to their data and used this to, to put some pressure on their um, ex-employers and also used this um, this right to to claim for some non-material damages afterwards if um, yes the the um, information the employer has provided was not uh, sufficient or was fulfilled belated or some some stuff like that and yes private enforcement became really really um heavy weapon for data subjects i think another thing that happened over the past five years also um is that it's not only gdpr right now it's the eu gdpr and and the uk gdpr at least for the time being yes uh i imagine you're wanting the dispatch from london um yeah uh, so i mean Obviously, Brexit happened in actually slightly, slightly more than five years since the vote. It's seven years, but um, the UK was still a part of the EU at the time that uh, GDPR came into force in 2018. So the UK fully implemented the GDPR. And then when um, it split off, it retained it as uh, the UK GDPR, which is essentially the same document, just with some of the references changed to domestic references. Um, But the big split that we're going to see maybe in the next year or so um, is that the UK might start to go its own way a bit and diverge, um, taking its first sort of post-Brexit steps away from the EU GDPR. Um, So last month, the UK uh, reintroduced its um, draft legislation amending the UK GDPR. Um, That's called the Data Protection and Digital Information Number 2 Bill. Um, It's going to be making its slow and steady progress through Parliament over the next few months. Um, And we we don't yet know what changes it will bring, but um, some of the proposed amendments will be things like um, changes to e-privacy enforcement in the UK and when cookie consent is required, not directly GDPR related, but these are things that are conflated cookie consent and and data protection, Um, a weakening of the accountability regime, particularly for smaller businesses, 
perhaps not the need to have a mandated data protection officer um, and, uh, you know, perhaps some uh, liberalisation of um, decision making, like automated decision making to make that a little bit more easier for um, UK businesses to use um, AI tools um, to make decisions um, based on people's personal data. Um, and then a big central feature will be um, the legitimate interests um, lawful basis might be made a little bit easier for businesses to use in the UK, where there will be guaranteed legitimate interests that businesses will always be able to rely on as a lawful basis. So a certain business practices will always be regarded as legitimate interests. And I think what's most interesting about the UK reforms is that we might see the EU follow the UK, maybe, <laughs> maybe the UK, maybe the EU will start, will make some, um, hopefully, common sense around the edges type changes. That's at least that's what the UK government has built its, um, its draft legislation as uh, in the hope that maybe we'll move the, the situation a little bit further in towards having it, having more business friendly type um, legislation and practices. Um, so I don't think the, what the UK is doing is going to be a wild west situation. I think it's more of an evolution in, um, in the UK, EU privacy um, sphere for the UK to move a little bit away from the EU privacy sphere, but nothing dramatic, thankfully. <laughs> I mean, something that clearly did not happen in Europe over the past five years is the e-privacy regulation that was expected to be adopted at the latest uh, five years ago. So yeah, if Brexit can um, pave the way for the UK to, to start a reform on the e-privacy front, uh, that would be great to see uh, the, the EU not necessarily follow suit, but at least provide some foreseeability um, to, to all the players involved. It, it will be interesting to see. And um, maybe maybe it's one of these things that just has to be demonstrated to, to make it real. And maybe the UK will be the little test bed for that. Um, but it will be it's, it's always been interesting to see the influence that the UK within the EU had. And that'll be interesting to see what influence it has outside the EU. Well, definitely Brexit has played a huge part also under, um, you know, in the last five years, so jointly with GDPR. But anyways, uh, I don't know about the UK, but I think it's pretty much the same. But like for Italy, what I've noticed in the last five years is that there has been an increasing awareness of companies in general to be more compliant with GDPR. Because in the very beginning, everyone like uh, this ac acronym, like a GDPR, what it is, what do we have to do? Uh, there was kind of a panic because um, like lots of companies realized that they had to go through lots of production of, docu of documents of every kind. Um, it was kind of, yes, a panic attack situation. And nowadays, they, their attitudes that they come to you just to ask, of course, for advice, what they have to produce, what can they avoid to produce, but it's still perceived as something that is kind of not exactly boring, but they have got this kind of attitude that we know that we need it, but how much do we need it, how, which are actually the real risks for that. But anyways, at least they know that now they do have to do something. We talked earlier about the awareness of the, the, the data subjects with regard to, to their right under, under GDPR, but for companies, it's still perceived as, as a hindrance or um, as a burden. Uh, at the same time, we had ESG rising to the forefront of, uh, of company governance, and the fact that privacy is not embedded into that ESG um, framework and still perceived as uh, as a pain it is a little bit counterintuitive. You would have um, maybe expected companies to address compliance as a whole and and put that data protection framework into into that general frame into the general compliance framework. Um, and another tendency that we've noticed is that there's a convergence between privacy on the one hand, but also competition or consumer protection. Um, and still, for companies uh, that are exposed to that risk, uh, they, they, they do not see um, the, the need for that being virtuous in terms of managing personal data, uh, which is for them not an investment, but a cost uh, center. 
Yeah, definitely agree. And um, on the subject of the awareness within companies, we, we talked about that with several DPOs uh, at the last IAPP conference in Paris. And well, they expressed their difficulties with the fact that they should give away information to the company so that awareness is like everywhere from an operational side, from a from the direction, from everyone that's taking decision. And they also should be able to make be the point of contact with the supervisory authorities. So everyone should be aware that um, like this is the center of the attention, or at least this should be one of the most uh, important subjects within the company. And so like the difficulty is uh, very often perceived from a DPO side. And um, so the subject still needs to get maturity um, inside everyone's brain, uh, including including operational sites like marketing, uh, sales, and everyone, so that uh, accountability can be implemented within all areas of the companies. So clearly, there have been some improvement over the past five years. There are still some areas that can be improved over over the coming years. So out of uh, out of ten, what what grade would you give GDPR uh, for the fast, first five years? Average, below average, above average? I would give it an average five, I guess, in all terms. Not yeah. more, not less. I'd say five or six. It's done some good in that it's focused people's attention on actually protecting personal data, but obviously it is a bureaucratic a piece of legislation and it is off-putting sometimes to businesses who have to grapple with how to implement it in their day-to-day operations. I agree. Uh, not more than six anyways, because now um, actually what I think is also very interesting in all this context is the approach of the supervisory authorities. And if actually privacy might be an excuse not to evolve technologically, or is it a way just to, is it really a way to protect our personal data or is it a way just to fight against US big companies, tech companies, or is it a way just to avoid te- technology, like to um, to go over certain burdens? Um, that's the question I'm asking recently with all the um, recent news about the relationship between supervisory authorities in the European Union and artificial intelligence companies. Um, let's see where this will take us. And we'll see also which is going to be the approach of the other privacy authorities. And if there is going to be kind of a data wars in terms of like the galactic empire against the, reb- the rebels forces. But in this case, I'm just wondering who plays the role of the galactic empire are the in artificial intelligence companies or rather the supervisory authorities. I do not give it for granted that they are in the good side of the force. Let's put it in that way. At least GDPR had the uh, advantage of starting the conversation, uh, starting the conversation of what personal data is. For uh, a big part in the U.S., they consider personal data or PII as a commodity that can be traded in in the European Union, uh, well, in geographical Europe, I'm going to keep um, including the UK in that consideration. It, it's a fundamental right. It's an um, it's an extension of the personality, and we got that divide. And one of the intent of GDPR, in addition to raising awareness of the individuals, was to raise awareness of the other countries that did not have a data protection framework. And what we've seen is an emergence of various frameworks, um, thinking about the UAE, uh, Brazil, even China. But you can see that the consideration, the local consideration, uh, is playing a very strong role. Um, PIPL can be perceived not necessarily as a data protection framework, but a data protectionism framework, where they require the data to be there. Uh, to be located there because they don't want the value to go away. Um, there might be some other uh, internal security consideration. So it's interesting to see that the devil is in the details, um, that 
countries may elect to uh, pass some data protection framework, but they're while they might be inspired by GDPR, they're not necessarily uh, cut and paste of GDPR. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that has increased materially over the last years, exactly what you said. And um, also quite interestingly, um, for us Europeans, um, we have our understanding um, of what privacy and data protection is, um, but that not, the, does not necessarily um, align with what um, the intention in other countries is in the background. And that will make it make it also for us challenging, I believe, um, to, um, yeah, to come to a, a, a common um, basis here with, with um, uh, experts from other countries who may have a completely different view on all this. Um, and so I assume that um, the whole data transfer and exchange um, world and scenarios will gain much more relevance. Um, in the last years, we have focused a lot on the transfer from the EU to the US. We all know that by now, by heart, um, we have seen two Schrems decisions. There will likely be five or six more. I don't know. Um, but um, that's pr pretty familiar to us by now. But um, other emerging countries um, where data is stored in, 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 in larger terms in the, in the last years, and that, that will increase, see India, see China and other um, countries, we haven't even started yet um, to um, yeah, compare and um, assess the legal um, frameworks existing in, in all these countries, uh, which may gain relevance in the next years. Um, and so I, I assume it will gain much more complexity in the future. Yeah, um, way more than five years ago when I was studying, um, I remember reading um, an article about how European data protection law was a, like an information law that it was going to influence how the rest of the world used and um, dealt with privacy and information. And what struck me is that while GDPR has almost been exported in some form since it came into force into lots of other regimes, other countries, um, yeah, the local emphasis is different. Um, the UK itself is going through its transition phase of post-Brexit and actually removing the human rights basis for, for um, data protection um, as evidenced by the uh, the responsibility for the legislation has shifted around government from the justice ministry now to a new science and technology ministry that's recently been set up. So they're sort of explicitly positioning data as a tool for um, economic development and um, and technological innovation. Um, and other countries will start to do that too, as, as Claude mentioned. Um, so yeah, the the basis is GDPR. It originated in the EU, but it's it's becoming differently perceived in, in different countries. And maybe that's for the good. Maybe every country should have its own way of dealing with personal data. But how we um, interact and interface in the uh, data, international data transfer space is really going to be important. And maybe that's where international collaboration is going to be needed and maybe accepting that we don't all view d personal data as a fundamental human right, but that maybe we do need to be able to um, share it across borders. So having some sort of basic international standards um, might be where we all end up with. And I know this is something that's been talked about a lot in various conferences that we've all dealt with recently. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see the next phase of GDPR and its more global phase maybe. To, to to close off eventually, uh, let's do a, a, a speed round um, on the future. What do you think will be the uh, the top topics uh, for the coming month or year uh, for the next stage of GDPR? I'm really looking forward to any um, close relationship with competition and data protection in general. So any anything that could uh, come up in the next few months. Uh, especially a decision we are expecting uh, about the competition side of um, GDPR. I'm expecting 
in the near future, a very relevant decision to private enforcement under GDPR. On the 4th of May, the European Court of Justice will issue its first decision on uh, non-material damage claims under Article 82 GDPR. Um, I think at least in the German jurisdiction, it's an high expected and highly expected uh, decision because it will provide some clarification on on data subject rights under GDPR. That, that, that will be really relevant, I guess, um, because it will lead the way to how will GDPR be enforced in the future? Will it come from the authorities or rather from private individuals or perhaps also from uh, associations um, of the latter? Um, and yeah, just adding what may be expected, I'm really curious to see where we will end up in terms of international data protection. Will it be that we all grow more together um, uh, in, in this world um, or will it end up in more or less splitting up again and everyone keeping uh, their data in, in their own instances and uh, stop sharing more or less? Um, uh, I think we were really um, yeah, at a splitting point here and we, we will all have to decide how we, how we want to move on with that. Well, that's uh, um, probably too short an episode to address everything under the sun. Um, what I just to- said about the uh, upcoming decision is definitely the subject matter for a future episode as soon as the decision will be out. Uh, that should be uh, very instructive. And also uh, what Tom was mentioning about um, association of individuals, like the uh, the collective uh, action uh, for enforcement of GDPR should be a, an interesting way forward. There's also some uh, procedural update, so not a full revision of GDPR, but uh, uh, the European Parliament is is working on, on streamlining everything. So not necessarily a revolution of GDPR, but an, an evolution, uh, streamlining, harmonizing, uh, trying to avoid the split uh, that, uh, uh, that Thomas was uh, fearing uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, so a lot to be seen. Uh, in the meantime, uh, wishing GDPR a very happy anniversary, uh, and uh, also seizing that opportunity to uh, to thank Eleonora uh, for everything that she's done. Uh, you've been instrumental in launching this podcast, and uh, um, we'll see you soon, maybe as a guest on this podcast. And thank you for everything. Um, thank you, Claudie. Uh, this is getting quite emotional. Um, I uh, really wish that you're going to be great and the podcast is going to do great um, because you know how much I do love it. My heart is with you and with this podcast as well. I know it is in great hands. Um, And you know, life is unpredictable, so never say never. And thank you all for the support and happy birthday, GDPR. May the enforcement be with you all. Always. And have Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Gateway to Privacy. To listen to past episodes and receive notices for new episodes, subscribe by searching Hub Talks. That's H U B Talks in your favorite podcast app. Tune in next time for more data privacy insights.